You're listening to WSFM LP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina. This is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist radio show airing on Sundays between 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm Bursa Goodness. And I'm William Goodenough. The show can also be heard on KXCF in Marshall, California, KWTF in Bodega Bay, California, KOWA LP in Olympia, Washington, and WCRS in Columbus, Ohio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. You can email us at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net with anything you want. And you can send us snail mail at The Final Straw, care of Asheville FM, 864 Haywood Road, Asheville, North Carolina, 28806. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee, located at 610 Haywood Road. Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. Firestorm's full catalog of books and zines can be found online at firestorm.coop. We're speaking with Lawrence Chirac. Lawrence is the author of many articles and topics ranging, ranging from post-left anarchy to the Spanish Civil War to civilization to technology and organization. Lawrence is currently a co-editor of Anarchy, a journal of Desire Armed. Ajoda, as I'll be referring to it here, has been operating since 1980 and is now published currently once a year. I really appreciate you chatting, Lawrence. Oh, happy to be here. Can you talk a bit about Ajoda, its history, and how it developed during your tenure as co-editor? Um, sure. Well, um, we took over from Jason McQuinn, who who was looking to get out of the project to start something new, which he did with Modern Slavery, uh, which is a big, fat magazine, more long-form essays than, than what we do in Ajoda. And so that's that's where he went. Uh, he wanted to make sure that, that the integrity of the project remained well, so... He trusted me, and I hope I've earned that trust. And I was able to uh, generate some interest with other people in the area and various combinations. Um, we've, we've solidified down to a, a hardcore of three for the last, well, I don't even know how many years now, uh, four or five years now. And, and we use uh, Charles at Eberhard Press as our layout and design person. Uh, and then we're very, very happy with the way the magazine has, has looked since he took over. And the three of us decided a few years back that uh, once a year publishing schedule was going to work better for us since we all have lives outside of the magazine. The magazine takes a lot of time, and so does stuff that we do outside of the magazine, um, anarchist or not. And so we just decided to do it once a year and make that so that we wouldn't go completely crazy if we had more people involved, we would consider publishing it twice a year again, perhaps. But at this point, it's an annual event, and we bring it out in the spring. So our last issue came out a few months back, and we're pretty happy with, with this issue. We've tried to regenerate the web presence. None of us are particularly tech-savvy, nor are any of the three of us that good at uh, marketing ideas. So our subscriber base is fairly steady, uh, but we would love to increase it, and uh, subscriptions are available through the website. If people are interested, it's anarchymag.org, and uh, one of one of the things that uh, we do at the magazine that's probably different from most other periodicals, and this is something that Jason implemented when, when he first started the magazine, is that we print all the letters that we get, uh, with the exclusion of death threats and you know, obviously meandering, incoherent things. But we do publish all the letters that we get. Sometimes we have few letters. Sometimes we have a lot of letters. Sometimes, you know, one, one, two really long letters and a couple that are just one or two sentences. Um, but we try to maintain those open communicating, open communication lines with our readership uh, to make sure that we are, we know what we're doing and they know what we're doing. In an interview that you did with Free Radical Radio earlier this year, you talked about the small readership or subscription base as kind of a sign of a positive engagement. Do you recall what I'm talking about? Um, I remember the interview. I'm not sure that I remember characterizing it as a positive thing. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm always more interested in uh, quality than quantity, that's for sure. We would love to have more subscribers. That would be really cool. Uh, we just don't know how to get them. I often think of Ajoda as a project that espouses or at least makes ample room for critiques coming from a post-left anarchist perspective. Is this something you consider to be correct about the magazine? Uh, absolutely, yes. Although I, I would not characterize it as uh, the discourse is post-left anarchist. Post-left anarchism is, 
it's kind of a clunky way to describe it. I prefer to call the discourse post-left anarchy rather than um, you know, kind of solidify it into uh, another another kind of ideological framework. Uh, one of the things that, that a post-left discourse tries to do is uh, reject ideological frameworks, and that's that's definitely a project that's, that is near and dear to Jason's heart. But we, we try to do the same thing. A lot of people don't don't recognize or don't understand that there's a difference between anarchism and anarchy. I never get tired of trying to explain the difference. So anarchy is a term for a condition of existence for people living outside of the state or without the state. So anarchy is just that. It's a description. It's not an ideology. It's not a program. It doesn't require uh, specific tenets or principles in order to exist. And if you look at the anthropological record, most anthropologists would agree that 99% of human history, we existed without the dubious benefit of the state or governance or government or any other kind of institutionalized hierarchical framework for mediating social conflict. So I would say that anarchy as a condition of human existence is the most successful model. And in fact, governance is the aberration in, in human history. Anarchism is a political philosophy that describes the problems with statecraft, the problems that are generated by institutionalized hierarchies, institutionalized forms of oppression, and the existence of anarchism requires anarchists. The condition of anarchy doesn't require anarchists. In fact, I would, I would argue in my more bitter moments that it's probably better off without anarchists. So that's, that's a distinction that I think is, is important to, to emphasize. Now, the, the, the post-left part of that is where things get a little tricky, um, because most people who are involved in politics are so accustomed to the binary of left versus right. So post-left folks are often accused of engaging in a right-wing discourse just because of a lack of imagination or a lack of subtlety on the part of uh, the left critics of the post-left anarchy discourse. But we don't we don't say we're post-right because there is not a rightist tradition in anarchism historically. There has been a left anarchist, and there, there still is a left anarchist history and tradition. And there are certainly left anarchists. Anarcho-syndicalists would, would be in that group. Most anarchist communists would be in that group. And the post-left discourse points to some of the the unfortunate overlaps that left anarchists have with non-anarchist leftists. A tendency toward organization for the sake of organization, a tendency toward mass movement, a tendency toward mass culture, a tendency toward a bureaucratization of uh, organization, no matter how big or how small. So for post-left folks, well, I can't speak for all of us. Let me just speak for myself. And, and a couple of examples. I would say that post-left anarchy discourse is pointing toward the anti-bureaucratic roots of anarchism as a distinct political philosophy. So, so I am not really trying to be innovative. I am trying to remind other anarchists of a very deep skepticism and or rejection of organization for the sake of organization, bureaucratic mechanisms and institutions, alliances with people who would prefer that you are a body and not a speaking person or a thinking person. Uh, there's, a, there's what I see as a great deal of uh, uh, conformity in left anarchist thought and practice, and I, I rebel against that. Uh, one of the one of the things that uh, post left anarchy promoters are not afraid of is the in 
individualist tradition in anarchism, which has been a minority position historically, uh, but it has been there nonetheless. And to to ignore it and or denigrate it as somehow not genuine is, I think, historically untenable and intellectually dishonest. But now I'm starting to get off on tangents, so I'm going to... Tangents are great, personally. I I love tangents. Okay, well, um, for for a a good introduction to to that, uh, the individualist end of of what could be considered a a broad post-left discourse, um, I definitely recommend the book Enemies of Society, um, published by Little Black Cart several years back. And it is all about the uh, egoist, nihilist tradition um, in historical anarchism. Some of some it's an anthology, so some of the stuff in there is not really great. And there's a couple of authors in there that I find really irritating, um, but it is an important document nonetheless. Uh, tendency that most left anarchists despise and or ignore. Uh, depending on who they are and, and where they're coming from at a particular moment and what kind of ideological points they want to they want to score. Can you talk a bit uh, more about the critique of mass culture and movements within post-left anarchy? Some have taken this to be a sort of poo-pooing of the majority of people, as in they're too dumb or not ubermensch enough or whatever to be worked with or to assume that you have anything in common with them. Well, there there is an aspect of the discourse that has that in it, and and that, that's definitely a part of the egoist. Uh, discourse that I, I don't find convincing sounds very elitist to say, oh, most people are just dumb. And my experiences in the, in the world of of in, of work, which I have done since I got out of college, I work with normal people. I don't work with with political radicals. I don't work with um, anybody at my workplace, which has over 300 employees right now, who considers himself an anarchist. I think there was one a couple of years ago, but she moved on to something bigger and better. So I don't, I don't have regular day-to-day conversations with anarchists most of the time. And my sense is that most people are actually pretty intelligent. They're, they're not stupid. They um, have been spoon-fed a bunch of bad information from the Times. That, that they were little kids. Uh, public schooling is is obviously a, uh, an institution of indoctrination into the status quo, and it would it would be foolish to think that most people who come out of that are somehow going to become political radicals. That that there will be one turning point or several turning points in their lives where they will wake up somehow and say, "Oh, I was taught." All of this bad stuff. This is all bad information that I've been getting. Uh, you know, if 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 that were the case, then there would be a lot more radicals in the world than there are now. The fact that that education slash indoctrination is is continues despite all the budget cuts and school closings is that it, it's actually an effective way to to keep people invested in the status quo. So that's a part of the of the egoist tradition that I that I've it makes me uncomfortable because I actually don't think people are stupid. Most most people are intelligent enough to know that when anarchists talk to them, what it sounds like the anarchists are saying is that they just want to be better bosses than, or better better instructors or better leaders than the ones that exist now. Um, and that's certainly been my experience with most of the anarchists that I've engaged with over the last 30 odd years that I've been doing this stuff. So my sense is actually a, a quite opposite of what that sounds like, and that is that most normal people, if normal is the non-political radical people, most normal people can see through the anarchist nonsense and know that, that what what it means when the anarchists say what they're going to do is it means probably longer hours at work and a lot more meetings. And who the hell wants that? Instead of a meeting, what do you propose? <laughs> There's a there's an interesting way of, of looking at how decisions are made in groups and in, in some of the sociological or anthropological literature they talk about the the meeting or the the organization meeting versus the campfire and the organization meeting is when 
you get a bunch of people together and you decide on an agenda and you have you know, spokesperson for a particular agenda and it's the it's the butcher block paper, everyone sitting in a circle, using consensus model, decision making. Um, it's all very formalized. You know, they're and since since Occupy there are all these well, it's before Occupy, but since the popularity of Occupy now you've got all these hand signals for how you interrupt somebody who's saying something that uh, you have an answer to et cetera, et cetera. So you've got the, you know, the crazy hand signals. That's all, that's all formalized. The general assemblies that, that took place during Occupy, those are formal uh, decision-making bodies. The campfire, on the other hand, is much more informal. And in fact, it's difficult to call that a decision-making body because it is so informal. It doesn't have agenda necessarily. It doesn't have clicks. It doesn't have incipient bureaucracy involved in it. The argument of the of the uh, organizer meeting folks is that campfire is a click. And so when you when those folks come over into the general meeting now they have their own little block and they've got their own particular agenda that we've decided beforehand. And that's where the, the whole tyranny of structurelessness argument comes in. But I would I would say that the campfire is probably the better way to make decisions. Whether you can do that sustainably on a large scale is is a different question. So the, the issue of mass culture, to get back to your original question, the reason why I have a strong critique sliding toward a rejection of mass culture is because you wind up with a situation where conformity is, is rewarded, where uh, being a a dissident or a dish disturber or any kind of deviant from the norm, whatever the norm might be, is a a lonely and unrewarding place to be. As an anarchist without adjectives, I would say that there should be a, a high value placed on dissent, a high value placed on uh, dish disturbers, a high value placed on that kind of questioning of conformity because conformity leads to stagnation, as far as I can tell. And the constant butting of heads against conformity and against stagnation is what I see as the strength of anarchism as a, as a discrete, sorry, discrete political philosophy. Without it, I don't, I don't think there's much worth in, it, in anarchism. And that's one accusation that, that like, or one bogeyman or, or straw man or whatever that people put up and about anarchists is that, like, well, you're just arguing for the sake of argument. You don't even believe what you're saying. You're just, you know... You're just Diogenes or whatever with the dogs. Like, is that is that something that you think is valuable, or is that just a, a caricature? I think that's a caricature. My experience is that most anarchists argue for the sake of of um, an actual position. Now, whether whether they can argue for that position or not is is a separate issue, and that may be uh, a reflection of what people object to that. Because the ideas are so bizarre, that is outside of the framework of of what would be considered normal politics, uh, it is it does it can probably sound like I'm just arguing for the sake of arguing. They, they may not actually believe what they say, but my experience is different. My experience is that that most anarchists really do believe what they say. They just may not be able to say it the best way. That's fair. Um, a few minutes ago, you pointed to the accusation by some that the post left is actually on the right, and I, I understand this argument that the spectrum is a, <clears throat> is a contrivance and based on like a stupid event and set up during the French Revolution, uh, and not being able to think outside that box is a bit dumb. But there are folks on what I'd consider to be the right or the reactionary side of people, so-called national anarchists, who self-identify as being post left, also. Do you personally consider them to be a part of the post-left anarchist a- anarchy family, or is that are they just? No, no definitely not. I mean, I, I I know that that one of my essays was was linked to the Bay Area National Anarchist website many years back when they actually still had you know their three people involved. Um, as far as I can tell, those folks have all moved away, they've, and they've jettisoned any pretense to being anarchists at all. The, the fact that they that they linked to my essay doesn't mean that there was any actual um, affinity between our 
our respective ideas. The reason that they linked to my essay was because they don't like the left, and I'm not crazy about it either. And that, that's why they linked to my essay. But I, I did write a little column about that, you know, what is the responsibility of a writer? And my decision was that uh, my writing should not be used to the advantage of any of my enemies. So I told uh, the Bay Area National Anarchist to fuck off and uh, stop linking to my essay. Um, not that I think that they're, they're uh, relevant or powerful or interesting, but even even if they're not, uh, I don't I don't want anything to do with those people. Uh, they're completely reactionary. They have nothing in common with an actual anarchist tradition, because of, as most people who are who are sophisticated about their anarchism will already know. Anarchism doesn't mean just being against the state. There's other things involved in it as well. And uh, the, the folks who are involved in national anarchism, I, I put a big sick after that in parentheses, their, their ideas are, are very far away from any kind of traditional understanding of anarchism. We, we have nothing in common with them. There might be another reason, too, that the... Uh... Uh, I'm cheating because I'm looking at Wikipedia. But Richard Hunt, who is a British editor, or he is on the editorial board of Green Anarchist magazine, which is as a, not to be confused with Green Anarchy from out of published out of Eugene. Um, but that person went on to podcasting and, and self-identified as uh, and publishing and self-identified as the national anarchist, but also post leftist too. So there is that as as stupid as their ideology or philosophy may be, there is like a tendency that exists prior to your writing of that essay. You know. For sure, and you know, I I can't prevent anyone from calling themselves whatever they want, but if you if you actually take a look at at Hunt's stuff um, or any of the other third positionist stuff, you'll see that that if you scratch just a little bit of the surface, the pretense to being against institutionalized hierarchies disappears very quickly. The institutionalized hierarchy that that all the, the Northern European third positionists want is like power, uh, they they don't like the state because they believe that that the state is not loyal to whiteness. Uh, there's, there's nothing in, nothing about that that has any commonality with any kind of anarchism anywhere. Because the because the term anarchism has a certain cachet in um, a marginal kind of uh, political discourse. For a long time, it was really fashionable for just about anybody to just throw the anarchist label on themselves or not to object when other people threw it on them. I mean, think, think of somebody like Naomi Klein. She was called an anarchist when she first started writing her, her <laughs> anti-global stuff. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it makes me laugh. You know, she, she's uh, some kind of social democrat. Nothing to do with anarchism. If, if you asked her, I'm sure she would now deny that she's an anarchist or ever was one, which would be the honest way to go. But you can't you can't stop other people from characterizing you in a particular way. Same way you can't stop somebody from self identifying in a particular way, even if it has nothing to do with history, nothing to do with, with any kind of recognized tradition. So I, I can't stop Richard Hunt from calling himself an anarchist. I mean I I could I could object to it. If he were relevant to my life, I would object to it. It's not relevant. Once you stop being involved in, in Green Anarchist, you stop being relevant. I've appreciated the critiques that you and other authors between Ajoda and GA have brought over the years. But I just, like, there's certain points that when I hear other people addressing post-left anarchy and the, or insurrectional anarchy or Green Anarchism, like, I hear people just bring up, like, oh, Green Anarchists, like, they just want the mass die-off of the human race, and they're, you know, blah, 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 and these post-left anarchy people are just too agitated to sit through a meeting, and, you know. Well, I am agitated to sit through a meeting. I'm also, I'm also old enough to know that what's going to happen at the meeting, and I'm, I'm thoroughly bored by it. I've got better things to do with my life. So I enjoyed the last issue, number 76, of Ajoda very much. Usually the issues contain multiple articles, but this one featured one long piece entitled Against Identity Politics. Without putting words in the author's mouth, can you talk about the article and why y'all chose to feature it so prominently? Well, the article is, I would consider, long overdue in the anarchist scene. I, I tried to provoke a discussion about identity politics several years back with a, with a short essay, well, short group of 
of aphorisms, maybe called preliminary theses for a longer discussion on the problem of identity of, of essentialism and identity politics. Anyway, it didn't go very far. There was one discussion about it. It was my, I was quoted out of context. It was basically a hatchet job by somebody with an axe to grind against me personally, and uh, so that, that was not as discussion that ever happened. Uh, but the, the current essay, I think, is much better than my initial attempt. It's more comprehensive and takes into account all kinds of sociological and psychological issues as well as political issues. And the, the thesis is essentially, if I can use that word in a non-ironic way, mm-hmm. that identity politics creates identity police. And when you have a group of people who are wedded to a particular identity, the necessity to police the boundaries of that identity grows up along with the identity. And so you wind up with a particular set of social practices based on antagonistic relationships that are certainly not exclusive to identity politicians, but they are the ones who who interact most with anarchists these days. And it's especially prevalent in, in an activist context. Uh, it certainly was one of the, from, from my perspective, it was one of the reasons why Occupy internally fizzled. And not, not, it had nothing to do with, with the repression of the state, which was quite enormous and coordinated. Uh, but the issue of identity polit- politics was one of the Achilles heels of Occupy. Since it was, it, whenever the issue was addressed, it was only addressed by identity police, and they made most other people who were just getting into social activism, or at least public social activism, made them very uncomfortable. On a basic level, it told them that they, that they were worthless because they did not understand the role of historical oppression in the way that police behave, or the way the state behaves. And again, like, like the, uh, the egoist elitism of calling up, calling people stupid, and they're too stupid to understand this. That's basically what identity politicians are saying to you know, the, new, the new crop of activists, is that you're too stupid to understand racism, uh, you're too stupid to understand colonialism, so listen to what I say, do what I say, or we're going to call you out, right? We're going to denounce you publicly, we're going to heckle you at an event, we're going to shut you down, whatever other mechanisms that... that they can devise for making a person feel unwelcome, uh, chastised, otherwise out, out, outside the, the bounds of polite discourse. A lot of what the essay is about is, is the actual mechanisms of, of that policing and how they are rooted in a discourse that is basically malice and very influenced by ideas of social conformity and, and uh, creation of an alternative set of uh, hierarchical institutions, basically. And uh, that's why I thought that it was uh, was timely, for sure, and uh, important to get out there, and we wanted to provoke some kind of discussion. And have you gotten much feedback on the article? None. We've had no feedback on it whatsoever. Seriously? There's (laughs) there's so much in there that that's really surprising. Well, it's only available in print, although somebody did scan it and post it online somewhere, you probably search for it, but there's no, there's no, I think on that website, there's no uh, discussion uh, forum function. So I still, still haven't heard anything. I mean, I heard one, one of our subscribers wrote us and said, wow, it's great. I'm so glad you wrote this. That will be published in the next issue. But you know, that just a fan letter is, uh, is not really a discussion uh, as important as fan letters are. Yeah, so we haven't we haven't posted it online anywhere. We want people to read it in the magazine. Maybe that's maybe that's a mistake on our part in terms of, of marketing. But maybe maybe we'll uh, we'll put a couple of paragraphs on the web on our website. See if that generates anything. So to, maybe we can I, not to not to dissuade, but maybe to entice people into engagement with the essay um, and hopefully buying it, purchasing a copy with your hard earned American cash. Could we parse some of the ideas in it? Yeah. One of our discussion groups here in town ended up reading it, and um, it was a pretty divisive conversation, and a lot of people were made really uncomfortable by it, by the content, or just poo-pooed it. 
I, I've said poo poo twice now. That's pretty bad. But one of the things that the author, who is going by Lupus Dragon Owl, talks about when making the the statement of that it comes from a Maoist tradition is referring to something called the principal contradiction, which I had to Wikipedia, and because I don't have a full Maoist library in my house, sadly. Can you break down that idea, or do you want me to go into like? It comes right out of Marxism, and it is the idea that you can look at all of these other mechanisms of exploitation and oppression that exist in, in an industrial culture, but really the, the main thing that, that unites them all or that, that has them all under its umbrella is capitalism. So the principal contradiction is the contradiction between worker and owner, uh, or in, in usual Marxist terminology, between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. So the way that that principal contradiction all of the other forms of exploitation and oppression is by saying once that principal contradiction is resolved, i.e. through the dictatorship of the proletariat, then all of these other institutions will will wither away, just like the state is supposed to wither away. Uh, the anarchist critique of, of that kind of logic has, has always been, I think, that these other institutionalized oppressions and forms of exploitation may be the result of having a capitalist-based economy. But many of the forms of those hierarchies that pre-exist capitalism as a, a discrete economic system. So there, the, uh, the argument that the oppression of women or the, the domination of women by men is older than capital is a very convincing argument. You can look at cultures that do not have capitalist-based social and economic relations, and you can see the oppression of women. Uh, you can see that there is a tendency of the old to rule over the young, and not just because they have more experience, but because they, they have a tendency to do that, to be bossy. So the idea that there is a principal contradiction that, and, and the, the resolution of those contradictions or the the Hegelian synthesis of those contradictions will somehow naturally flow from the re- resolution of the principal contradiction is belied by actual cultural history. If you look at any of the models that various Marxist sects point to in the 20th century as, as having resolved the principal contradiction, uh, even in a deformed way that that, this, that a certain Trotskyists like to look at uh, the former Soviet Union under Stalin see it as, as fundamentally a worker state, but it was deformed by a bureaucracy. Whole different discussion. You can still see in a worker's state, according to the Marxists, that there is still patriarchy, there is still racism, there is still uh, a yearning for some kind of colonial relationship with other states. Uh, those so the, the notion of a principal contradiction is, is somehow this, solving that principal contradiction is this magical way of resolving all other social contradictions from an anarchist perspective. Completely absurd. There's also the argument that when the principal, contradic- the contra- principal contradiction can shift between subjects as needed by whatever vanguard there is, like suddenly, oh, because of this situation, it's no longer about just capitalism, it's about imperialism, or it's about, you know whatever happens to be the contradiction of the day, the, you know, du jour. Yeah, that, and that, that's a process that, that Marxists called dialectics. And uh, as, as a very funny person once said, dialectics is what Marxists invoke when you catch them in a lie. So, yeah, the, the revolutionary subject changes based on what, what sect of Marxism you're, you're going for. And also it, it has to do with wherever the Marxists think they can uh, gain some kind of political traction. So if it is an issue of, of patriarchy or the oppression of women, then patriarchy is uh, the primary contradiction that all others stem from. And it's especially attractive for people who take a more, I don't know if accurate is the word that I want to use, but a, a more sophisticated understanding of history to look at the, the aspects of oppression that 
predate capitalism. I think that one of the one of the better examples of that, sort of, is uh, Sylvia Federici's Caliban and the Witch. Um, it also has its own problems because she only she's only looking at cultures that eventually did become capitalist, and doesn't look into the ways that that women have been oppressed and or exploited in cultures that did not develop into capitalist cultures. Um, that's, and that is a failing of, of her as a, as a researcher. But uh, her point is still well taken that the uh, subjugation of women uh, predates the subjugation of a, a mass of people called proletarians. And uh, that's, that's, that's a fairly decent example of, of the shifting of the plan contra- uh, primary contradiction, but it doesn't doesn't get at the issue of the problem of formulating an analysis based on a primary contradiction. And that, that's actually something that, at least in its beginning stages, certainly not anymore, but the beginning stages of, of the discourse on intersectionality uh, took that as a given, that there are different locations of oppression and, and exploitation that have um, maybe something to do with capitalism, but maybe not. And, and it doesn't mean that, that those institutions are any less oppressive um, because they don't have capitalism as, as part of their mechanism. Um, I mean, at this point, the intersectionality discourse, at least in academia, has, has become completely sidetracked into, into a way to say, basically, if you don't accept intersectionality, then you are a racist, sexist, Imperialist, blah blah blah, and it's it's being used as another bludgeon by people on the left, especially in academia. Seems like it seems like inter- intersectionality, and I'm I'm outside of academia, so I don't see how the left is interacting with that in academia necessarily. But it seems like the idea of intersectionality allows for an attack on the idea that there's a a pyramid of like a hierarchy of oppressions. Right? Yes, that's that. Uh, the, the discourse began exactly in that way. And it has it has been turned around into another another boundary to police. Some of the stuff that takes place in, in intersectionality discourse is really horrific to me. Um, I don't have any any examples at my fingertips at the moment, but the author of of our essay has a bunch of examples. And, and in, in the correspondence that we've had since the issue was published, you know, he's pointed me to a bunch of these things, and, and they are are really not cool. So there's, I mean, there's specific practices and if i'm if i'm like beating it at a horse with with this article let me know or or going down an uninteresting path for you but there's like instances in the article where it does point to um besides primary contradiction uh, as like laying a foundation as to the main focus of a certain group's uh way of interacting and, and shutting down any argument that doesn't center the argument that they want to focus on there is also pointing to other Maoist tendencies within some of the activities that are taken on by folks who the author identifies as identity politicians. So like calling out um, to some degree, like maybe accountability processes, uh, denunciations, interruptions, threats, things like this. And the author makes the statement or the claim that this can be traced back to the like Maoism that came into the left in the U.S. in the 1960s. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that stuff all happened during the Cultural Revolution. And it, it was, uh, those, those practices were adopted by American Maoists, adopted by international Maoists, uh, pretty much everywhere, uh, as, as a successful toolkit for exposing class traitors, essentially. And a class trader is anybody who doesn't follow the party line. That's how I see it, uh, as a cynic. But I suppose there's some kind of internal logic in, in Maoism that allows people to, to engage in that kind of denunciation. Uh, there's also the, uh, the famous criticism, self-criticism session, which in, in the United States especially uh, degenerated into what's called a fishbowl, where one person sits in the middle of their sensible comrades, and everyone takes turns denouncing them for their, their failures as a revolutionary. And the person eventually has to agree that all of these characterizations are correct, or they get kicked out of the party. I mean, it's, it's, it's just the most 
I think, transparent way of, of generating group conformity. And uh, there were there were certainly mind control aspects of it, and there were there was at least one cult-like Maoist sect in the Bay Area back in the, in the 70s that engaged in this kind of process regularly. Some of the survivors have talked about it publicly. Yeah, it, uh, it it's very easy to go down that path, and it it's essentially a, a tool for for generating conformity, group cohesion. Uh, and internal conformity. I w- would have thought that anarchists worth the name would be able to see right through that kind of authoritarian nonsense, but I am wrong, as I have been frequently on occasion, more than one. Well, you heard it here on The Final Straw. Lawrence Chirac <laughs> is wrong. I'm just kidding. <laughs> frequently. <laughs> <laughs> frequently. Like any human being. Do you think that the like return of those methods, and maybe it's not so much a return as the amplification of those methods, is a product of Maoism coming back, or is it just that like certain groups of people are finding these tenant or these like activities to be useful for controlling the like controlling debate, shutting people down? Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I would call it a resurgence of Maoism. Um, there is this tendency of current crop of activists look back on the late 60s and early 70s period, especially in, in a United States context, as this time of, of Like a watershed? Yeah, this, and it was a time of revolutionary greatness when, when, there was, when people really believed that revolution was on the horizon, whatever revolution meant to them, um, but that, that groups like the Weather Underground, Red Army Faction in Germany, the Japanese Red Army, and various other armed struggle groups, you know, they were the pinnacle of revolutionary internationalist solidarity um, with third world struggles for self-determination and and decolonization, etc. So if if you accept that those groups and those practices that they were engaged in were the pinnacle of of revolutionary uh, excitement or purity or potential victory, then, of course, you're going to look at the application of various of their methodologies, at least internally, to your own activism. And I don't think that it's necessarily a conscious embrace of Maoism as much as it is an embrace of mechanisms to create conformity and cohesion. what, What better way to generate cohesion, to engage in a ruthless denunciation of backsliding toward a bourgeois existence among radicals. That's such an easy target. And the easiest way to do that is is to find some kind of personal failing in whoever you decide has that failing. And to elevate that personal failure into um, some kind of world historical importance as a betrayal of fundamental principles, as, a, as an inadequate rupture with their own past, uh, what, whatever terminology is used in, in invoking this kind of activity doesn't really matter. What's important is that the rest of the group gets to bond with this experience. And that's what's one of the things that Lucas talks about as his essays is the, the kind of cathartic experience that people get when they're engaged in, in this kind of activity. Um, if, if you want to be part of something that you conceive of as bigger than yourself, even bigger than your, your group of a half a dozen or a dozen people, it's, it's very easy to find uh, personal failures of your comrades or your allies as being really, really, really important to point out, to denounce, to have an accountability process around. If, if, if this person's failures are, are uh, based in their uh, adherence, despite their, um, whatever indoctrination they've been getting in the group, uh, so they, they remain adherents of some kind of bourgeois cultural um, artifact, 
if if you call them on the carpet for that, if you denounce them for that, and they agree, and then they they decide that, that whatever the group does to them is justifiable in the name of revolution or, or social justice or whatever it is that, that they're promoting, um, that's a really intense bonding experience for the rest of the people in the group. Uh, it, it definitely builds cohesion. Um, that's better than a game of capture the flag does. I could see it also being on some psychological level cathartic to the individual who who like goes through the denunciation practice or like session and then is like sort of born again in the new revolutionary spirit of like I have failed the revolution but I will not again I am washed clean in the waters yeah it's very Christian very Christian it's it's a baptism by fire essentially and uh, it's a powerful powerful thing no question if if it didn't work, people wouldn't use it still. This episode of The Final Straw features bursts me interviewing Lauren Chirac, the co-editor, one of the co-editors of Anarchy, a Journal of Desire Armed, about identity politics, about call-out culture, about um, individualist anarchism, and much, much more. You may have already said this, but how do you think that this damages actual struggles um, in the United States? I mean, besides alienating individuals who are on the wrong end of the call-out culture, but... How does this damage actual attempts to address, um, like, institutionalized racism, institutionalized sexism, um, all of these oppressive hierarchies that, that do fundamentally exist within our, our current world, right? Well, the, the main thing that happens is that um, I, I don't want to get too psychological toward the people who are engaging in this kind of activity, but... What, what I see is that it's very difficult to attack an institution because you still have to attack individuals who are part of that institution. And those folks are insulated. They're insulated by um, dominant ideas of what common sense is. Uh, they're insulated by uh, an entire legislative uh, system. They're insulated by the police. So they are hard to get at. Um, you can shake your fist outside of a meeting of, of people you, you believe are responsible for most of the ills in the world. So, for example, the G8 summit or the G20 summit or whatever, whatever the G is at the meeting that's near your, your, uh, your home. Uh, you can stand outside of those meetings and, and shake your fist with a, a thousand other people Police can try to keep you in a protest ghetto. That's all really difficult, and, it, and it's difficult to see any kind of victory come out of of those kind of campaigns. Even if they're protracted campaigns, even if they don't have uh, enormously abstract end games, it's much easier to find an individual who may or may not be part of an institution, but who who represents that. To you, who is close by, who is known to you personally, uh, who is engaged in similar kind of activity, and because of, of one slight or another, or maybe many slights over a period of, of months or years, you take that person into, a, into an accountability process, you have found someone to denounce, you have found someone to have influence over, and if, if they... If they disagree with the call-out or the accountability process, then they leave your group or they leave your end of the struggle, that is a victory because you've now purified your struggle from a, a baleful influence of somebody who represents status quo. If, on the other hand, they agree with your denunciation and they, they internalize all of the actions that, that um, you have thrown at them as a way to bring them, hold them to account, right? Or they, they, they engage in the crit self-crit session and at the end of it, they are self-critical and they agree that, that your, your path is the best path. That is also a victory because now you have one more cadre in your organization who is, you know now, 
after this baptism of fire is 100% committed to the cause. So either way, it's a victory for the person doing the denunciation. And it, again, if it didn't work, they'd stop doing it. But when you're saying work, uh, which you well, said twice, what you're not referring to necessarily what the proposed product of or outcome that the people conducting the session are necessarily doing, right? Or they're not like saying like, actually, we are making you a better revolutionary subject. Yeah. What they're doing that, is what... they're making you, well, I guess like they're making you more of a subject, right? Well, they're, they're subjecting you to stuff. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, but you, if, if you withstand the process and you come out agreeing with, with their denunciations, right, you are now an, an officially accepted member of the group. So that is a victory for the group. If, if you wind up dining, that is also a victory because now they don't have to worry about you anymore. But the, 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 it works in terms, it, it is a victory for the group because they have, they have engaged with a representative or someone they believe is a representative of all this bad stuff. And they have either transformed them or denounced them so badly that, that they no longer have any kind of influence over the course of, of whatever campaign is being organized. Um, the, the problem with, with that, not just in terms of alienating people who, who have to sit through it or who have to witness it, that it mistakes individual behavior for institutionalized relations. We, we are all products of, of whatever culture we grew up in, no question. So wh whatever vestiges we, we still have of that are, are there. They're, they don't just go away. You don't, you don't become um, anti-patriarchal just because you decide one day that you're an anarchist. Uh, you, you have to actually do stuff about it. And if, if you fall short of the expectations of people who, are, who have been engaged in anti-patriarchal activities for a long, long time, they've got a couple of choices. They can, they can hold your hand and say, hey, you've got to do this, this, and this. Or they can denounce you and say, you're, you're a sexist scumbag and we don't want to have anything to do with you. So the, the problem with that is that, again, you, the, the people who are engaged in that kind of denunciation are making a, a categorical error, they are seeing in a microcosm, that is, in an individual, the representative of an institutionalized hierarchy, a long-standing, multi-generational aspect of a exploitative and oppressive culture. So in, in like a Sternerist tradition, what they would be, they're confusing the individual for the specter of, or that like social category that's a construct. Right. And that's what, that's what Lucas talks about a lot in his essay as well. Is, is that, that categorical mistake, you know, a person is not some total of the aspects of their, of their appearance or their presentation. I, I am male bodied and I am relatively masculine looking but being a man in a patriarchal culture is not the beginning and end of who I am, not the beginning and end of, of any single male-identified or male-bodied person. That's not how it works. Um, and that, that's why I think that, that, at least at the beginnings of inter intersectionality discourse, was really, really important because it, it looks at the at multitude of intersecting and non-intersecting you know, parallel oppressions that exist all at the same time and even within the same individual. The same individual can be both an oppressor and a victim of oppression. And for people people who are only interested in a primary contradiction, it really messes with their heads. It, 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 it doesn't, doesn't make sense to them. Because everything really is about a large social category or a class, if you will. And uh, I would hope that an anarchist analysis would be a little more sophisticated than that. But again, I've been proved wrong on that count as well. And maybe that's because I actually believe that anarchists who call themselves anarchists are actually anarchists. Maybe that's, maybe that's my, my naivete. 
So is is the argument then the, the intersectionality that Lupus is coming across in these journals? This is just for my own edification. Uh, is like tending to like weave a tighter cloth out of someone having more oppressed circumstances, and therefore that puts them higher in a hierarchy rather than someone who's got less of those threads. It's more like a cheesecloth. Yeah, it, it does seem like like intersectionality has now become the the uh, the more objective way of of competing in the uh, oppression Olympics. Sorry to sound so cynical about that, but it, it really what it what it has come to mean in a lot of locations is that yeah we've got all these multiple oppressions, but I have more of them than you do, so I'm actually objectively more oppressed than you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and again that's that's the that's the debasement of how intersectionality discourse began so with folks that are like for instance i've been involved in um like an accountability group before and the purpose was to if someone had been hurt or someone had been attacked to go and confront the person who attacked or hurt or was perceived to have hurt an individual i guess you can't say that if somebody feels hurt they're hurt um like whether or not that was the intention of the other person or the memory of the other person, that's a, a separate issue. But, um, and, and found like found participation in that group to be really complex and tiring. And, uh, and by the end of it, at least in my experience, not very successful project through the few instances that we interacted with. It was, it was productive in terms of, um, a lot of conversations around consent, a lot of conversations around like when you push this person, this is how it feels to them. Maybe you shouldn't do that sort of thing. You know, pretty, pretty like simple conversations around consent and around communication. Um, but I think there's a lot of like good intention that goes into the sort of idea that, okay, we have this model of something that we can we can try to implement within our communities that doesn't require and is actually counter to the use of police prisons and courts uh and we could just do it as as a sort of you know diy but one of the problems is that it reproduces in a lot of ways the same models that the judicial system operates off of and that the police operate off of um if it if it does that it does it worse yeah because at least in the judicial system you've got the presumption of innocence that there's got to be some kind of proof involved, that there's, there's got to be some kind of impartiality involved with somebody who's sitting in, in judgment of, of this, whether it's a jury or an actual judge. Um, when, when it's a, a group of people involved in the same kind of activities that, that um, you know, pardon the, the, the legalistic language, the perpetrator and the victim are involved in, what you have is, is a, basically a group of vigilantes and it's, it's, uh, it, it may seem like it's directly democratic, but from the outside, if I'm looking at, at this situation from the outside, it looks a lot like mob justice to me. And that makes me really uncomfortable. Um, I, know, I know that it's, it's, there, there is no good way in a culture that is based on these kinds of legalities. There's no good way to counter that with the idea that you've got to have some kind of um, independent investigative body and you've got to have some kind of impartial uh, judge or panel of judges uh, in order to to make some kind of actual justice come at the end of it. Um, It's it's complicated. And, you know, I don't envy you your experience. It sounds like like it's very tiring uh, because you have to be, you have to be a detective, a lawyer, and a juror all at the same time. And when doing support for the perp- like the accused perpetrator or whatever, that means also like being a psychologist or a counselor. And <laughs> in my off time right. when I'm not doing my wage work. Right. Like, wow, who's got the time for that kind of stuff? I mean, I, I recognize that, that um, conflict resolution is a really important aspect of, of any kind of culture or subculture. Super important. It's one of the one of the things that that I I really enjoyed studying when I was when I was studying anthropology in college. Um, different mechanisms of conflict resolution are are really interesting. None of the models that I studied uh, sounded in any in any way much better in terms of the actual 
end result, if the end, re- if the end result was wanting some kind of accountability, right, um, which really just means blame or uh, responsibility for, for doing something bad, then most of the most of the conflict resolution mechanisms were not actually about that. They were they were more performance. You were saying that most of the outcomes that seemed to be expected were more like performative and retributive, I guess. Well, not not retributive. Um, the the ones that were more successful were the ones that were not retributive, but were performative, um, and. They, they don't even follow the model of restorative justice that, that is so popular among, among uh, certain activist crowds. In fact, it had very little to do with the actual uh, transgression of a particular individual, and more the uh, again, it was an exercise in social cohesion, uh, but it didn't involve necessarily uh, the kind of denunciation that that, that I associate with identity politics. Is there a model for conflict resolution that you think could that would that would be more functional within uh, a community that that believed in some degree of accountability or like respect among people when somebody transgresses against someone else? How does that get resolved? Um, not not expecting you to have all the answers or anything like that, but just I'm, I'm curious about what your perspective is on it. I don't even have an answer to that. I mean, really, it, because of all of the, the cultural baggage that each of, each of us carries with them, uh, I don't think that there is a positive model of conflict resolution that's workable above a small group of people who already know and trust each other. Um, I just can't see it. I mean, it, living in a place like the Bay Area, where there are so many different anarchist factions that that you can go your entire life in the Bay Area active as an anarchist, active as a social justice organizer, et cetera, et cetera, and never interact with people from another clique. It's that bad. And the lack of interaction is, is mostly based on loyalty to personalities. In that way, it's, it's sad, but in another sense, it's perfectly okay because whatever transgressions are perceived in one group, just go to a different group and they either will not have heard about it or it may not be earth-shattering to them. It's a strange situation here with factionalism. It's been that way for for as long as I can remember, Uh, although the factions were smaller back in the early days when I was involved in the the mid-'80s. The factions were there nonetheless. It's kind of weird, you know, that the... There isn't ever, I don't think there's ever going to be you know, a single model of an anarchist form of conflict resolution uh, that's going to work across all, all facets of anarchist subcultures. And part of me thinks that's okay, part of me thinks that's sad. I mean, we're not all interchangeable pieces. That's, that's something to be said, and that's like, that's fine, that's a good like, starting point. But it, it seems yeah. like a scary... A scary thing if I mean at least the internet does some stuff to be able to to allow for this sort of thing. But if someone if someone is perhaps like a confidential source to law enforcement and they've got enough cred or enough cultural passage within anarchist or punk or what queer circles that they can just sort of like shift from community to community and keep tabs on people, if there's not that communication between those different communities that are so similar or if there's a serial rapist that is among the communities that like continually will just like do this, get called out, and then like shift to Santa Cruz or shift to New York or Chicago or yeah, something heard, like that. That's scary. Yeah, I've heard of that happening too. And it's it's a failure of people's politics. But on the other hand, what do, what do you do about false allegations? Again, when when you're in a situation where you have to be the investigator, prosecutor, the defense, the jury, the psychologist, and the counselor. Um, that's just too many things to do at once. Too many, too many balls to juggle in the air at the same time. And if most of the most of the conflict resolution stuff requires people to be psychologists, then you will always fail because most people are not psychologists. And it, again, you've got all this cultural baggage. Like, like some people, I would consider myself part of this part of this faction. I I would much rather have retributive justice and restorative justice. Maybe that's because I grew up on the West Coast. 
Maybe it's because you know, my parents are who they are. Maybe it's because of the movies I watched when I was growing up. I don't know. But like, whenever I whenever I hear people on the radio talk about restorative justice, or whenever I've I've overheard people talking about restorative justice, it just sounds it sounds wimpy to me. Not that I'm all macho, but it doesn't sound like it's a real resolution. If there's, if there's a real conflict, you gotta hash it out. You can't just say, well, I'm, you know, I'm sorry I hurt your feelings. Yeah, the reason you hurt my feelings is because of this, this, and this. And I feel like a great injustice has been done. And how are you going to fix that? You're not going to fix that by baking me uh, a loaf of bread and inviting me over for a beer. But I'm old and cranky. So that, that may be some part of it, too. I mean, there's there's like elements of it that that seem in some of some of the literature coming out from uh, the revolution starts at home, right? Is this compilation of of abuse stories and confronting? In, the subtitle is confronting intimate violence within activist communities, and it has just like tons of tons of different folks' experiences of of different dynamics and different patterns and problems um, in all sorts of different relationships between all sorts of people that look different. And there were some of the, some of the at least attempts that people had constructed in, in that book that were like, oh, this is interesting. Like, so here's this model that you're operating out of in Georgia, which is, you know, somebody that you find out who vandalized your car and this person lives in the neighborhood and their family lives in the neighborhood. And you're like, well, restorative justice repair it, <laughs> fix the car. Otherwise, like we and your family are all going to give you crap or like you're going to, you get paychecks, you're going to get a second job, like pay this stuff off. And that's like mon- you know, monetary, but like a restorative justice model is, okay, this person killed someone in your family. Restorative justice, maybe that person, I mean, assuming that they'll, they'll do this sort of thing, like feels bad about it and they're like, you know what, I'm going to replace the labor they were supplying to your family and I'm going to like do work around your house or I'm going to, yeah. I mean, I could I could see something cathartic also about, and just like, at least it's not everybody having to walk through this process of like, okay, go to the meeting, okay, self-denounce, you know, did you read this, this chapter of the Paul Kivell book? Okay, let's talk about it. But like I, I can see both sides, and I, I I personally think that although it takes a lot more work, the idea of whatever community means, um, the idea of trying to sustain relationships that have a degree of a degree of cohesion or a degree of at least like respectable interaction, and where there's the assumption that if someone screws up, they're going to try to make amends or be asked to make amends doesn't seem that bad to me. It's when there's the institutions that are going to force someone to do labor for the sake of the institutions and call it justice for the victim's family. That's problematic, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I I hear what you're saying. And and I just like today, my temperament is not there. (laughs) (laughs) That's fair. Maybe maybe yesterday it was, maybe tomorrow will be again. I'm not really sure. Uh, Uh, issue for me is, is more about the person who feels wronged getting some kind of wholeness back through whatever mechanism they find is, is the most appropriate. Yeah, and, I see that. Uh, so I'm, I don't know. I don't know how, how I would want something like that done for, for me. I guess it depends on how, how badly wronged I would feel. So um, I've had you on for uh, an hour and 25 minutes, and since you said the word issue... Uh, what's up for issue number 77 of Ajoda? I know it's a long ways off, but do you have any, any teasers for the folks in the potential reading audience? Uh, the only thing that I can say is that I will be reviewing several books. Erico Malatesta, reader, the volume one of the, of the promised multi-volume set from AK Press. Uh, Malatesta was one of my favorite anarchists historically. I'm also probably going to do a quick and dirty review of a book that came out in 1998 called Key Concepts in Post-Colonial Studies. Basically, a short encyclopedia, some interesting topics. And what I'm going to do is look at the way that they were described in 1998 and take a look at how they are described in 2015. So how the terms are being used within academia, you mean? 
Yeah, like how, or not even academia, but in, in the activist world. So how, how things started to, to come different. And the way that the way that post-colonial or decolonizing discourse has been filtered through Marxism uh, and filtered through anarchism, and uh, there'll be plenty of uh, periodical reviews as well, at least three or four. We don't have a, a central essay at the moment, but uh, I am I'm always working on one about the role of history in anarchist practice, um, the importance of what I think is the importance of history, and studying it and, and not as a way to uh, relive it or refight the fights of forebears, but to um, generate some kind of lessons for the future, uh, present future. And are you, is, is there general solicitation for articles and reviews from the public? Like, can people just send in the work that they have? Sure. Um, we we don't guarantee anything when folks send us stuff uh, unsolicited, uh, but we do accept uh, people's writings. We, we will happily look at things, and if, if they uh, they seem like like they fit into the general trajectory of of our project, we will work with the authors and and uh, try to help them uh, make their writing better. And if they're going to contact you or look at if if people want to check out articles or reviews from past issues, how can they find that out and how can they contact you? Uh, well, the website is anarchymag.org and you, you can link to uh, contact and that, or you can just write editor at anarchymag.org and all your questions will be answered. I hope. <laughs> uh, yeah. that, that's my email, editor at anarchymag.org. Uh, you can also write me at lawrence at anarchymag.org. And if folks were to, if if they do not, if they sadly do not live in an area where one of the newsstands or bookstores carry it, where can folks find copies of Anarchy Magazine? Uh, well, you can ask for it to be uh, uh, carried at your local municipal library. Uh, we are connected to uh, several subscription services, institutional subscription services. So you can request it through your local library. You can request it through your local university library. You can subscribe to it yourself. You can uh, ask to distribute it. You can ask your local info shop to carry it, uh, your local independent bookstore to carry it. Uh, and we are open to all of, any and all of those inquiries. Happy to, to uh, make some kind of connection with people who are, who are interested in that. And copies can also be gotten from LBC's website? Yes, Little Black Card distributes it. Uh, our, our, our primary internet distribution is Little Black Card. Is, is CAL publication still a thing? Yeah, we publish pamphlets. Okay. Yeah, I hadn't, like, I remembered there was the Cal Press Review and Anarchy. And I guess, I mean, I guess Modern Slavery is a, a product, like, under that umbrella, too. And I know that, like, Anarchy yeah. After Leftism and, like, a few other things have been published through Cal. So, Modern Slavery, so Jason's project is still CAL Press. Ours is still CAL Press. They have different P.O. boxes. Um, and and we, we do different projects. Uh, just, it's the same, same umbrella outfit, but we don't collaborate uh, explicitly. We're, we're, we're sister uh, publications. Um, our snail mail address is Post Office Box 3448 That's in Berkeley, California, and the zip is 94703. We've been speaking with Lawrence Girac. Uh Lawrence is, again, the author of many articles on many topics and is currently a co-editor of AJODA, or Anarchy Journal of Desire Armed. Thanks, thanks a lot for taking the time. All right, thanks a lot. Yeah, take, you, care. take care. You're listening to WSFM LP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina. This is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist radio show airing on Sundays between 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm Bursa Goodness. And I'm William Goodenough. The show can also be heard on KXCF in Marshall, California, KWTF in Bodega Bay, California, KOWA LP in Olympia, Washington, and WCRS in Columbus, Ohio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. You can email us at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net with anything you want. 
And you can send us snail mail at The Final Straw, care of Asheville FM, 864 Haywood Road, Asheville, North Carolina, 28806. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee, located at 610 Haywood Road. Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. Firestorm's full catalog of books and zines can be found online at firestorm.coop.